Hey guys, little Ather here. So today we're going to be talking about something a little bit different in the world of gaming. And for those of you who have an open mind and are a little bit tired of the lineup of games today where, you know, there's not much of a, a great storyline and it's all about graphics and, and, you know, just flashy, uh, you know, uh, new features but, but still not really delivering on and getting you engaged. And so I'm going to be talking to you about Sierra Online. And some of you have, might not have heard of Sierra Online uh, before. Uh, they were actually a gaming company that used to be really popular back in the, the 1980s and were pioneers in the industry. They still do make games now today, uh, but not as, as frequently. And the company... Uh, was really in its its high point in the 80s and early 90s and and basically in the the mid 90s the original owners Roberta and Ken Williams sold the company and now to this day they're retired and they pretty much just travel the world on a boat so not living a bad life but uh they really made an impression with me because uh, I think they had a fantastic lineup of games and I, I still don't feel to this day that there's any uh, you know, any games that come close to, to having the same level of impression that they, uh, you know, their games made because um, they they were just they were just fantastic. So let me first talk about what what's uh, great about the Sierra games, and um, actually first of all, let me talk about what are the Sierra games, and then I'll talk about what's great about them, and I'll then I'll talk about. Uh, you know, why would you want to play the Sierra games? And I'll go into an overview of some of the different Sierra games that actually I, I recommend. Um, they have a lot of them, but I'll, I'll you know, go over some of the, the top ones that, that are well known. So first talking about what exactly are the Sierra games. So uh, back in the 80s, they had adventure gaming. And adventure gaming used to be uh, just pure text. So a game like Zork, where... You'd get a written description of you know what's what's happening. So it'd be you're in a field in a meadow with trees, and uh, you know to the left of you there's you know there's a rock, blah blah blah, and then you'd actually type in your response. So you'd say go north, and you go north, and it'd give you another description, or you say lift rock, and you peek under the rock, and there's nothing there. So uh, pretty uh, you know uh, it, pretty boring. Well, actually, I, I, that's criticism. Some games were fun, but, um, you know, you had to have a lot of patience, so this was just pure text. And Sierra did something different. They actually then added graphics to those written descriptions. They came out with a game called Mystery House. And simple little thing, but they added graphics, so, you know, for those of you who can't visualize very well, or you'd get that added, added element of, of having some graphics to it. And some of the graphics, those graphics were not fantastic. I mean, those were back in the days of the 80s. Uh, they were great for those standards, but, you know, they're pretty laughable now, just stick figures in some cases. But um, they created a game called Mystery House, and Ken Williams was actually a programmer, a computer programmer, um, you know, full-time, serious job, and his uh, his wife, Roberta, basically created the story for this, this game, because she... Um, would play some computer games for fun, and, and she thought, hey, this would be fantastic to create a, a, an adventure game which uh, which has some graphics. So they, they programmed it, and they sold it to computer stores one by one, and uh, they basically uh, sold uh, $169,000 worth of the game, uh, which is pretty darn good back then, considering the, the rate of inflation. That would have been a lot of money back then, and... You know, they're just selling this stuff out of a, you know, a, a, a package in a doggy bag, you know, and, and, and a floppy disk that they copy at home and back in the early 80s. So, needless to say, that was a, a, a massive success, and they uh, showed that they were onto something, and then started Sierra Online, started producing uh, a ton of games. And so they went from the actual, you know, um, just adding, you know, graphic screens here and there to, to different... Um, you know, to different texts, to, to actually having a, a character which you can move around the screen and then also type at the same time. And that was another revolutionary concept. 
which they implemented with the King's Quest series, the Space Quest series, and you know it, it gave you that feeling of interacting more with the world and walking, moving the character to that specific area, and then typing the command like search bush. You'd have to be close enough to the bush to actually search it, and that level at a level of interactivity uh, with it. And then they took that same interface and took away the typing element and made it more point and click where you'd, you'd click and you'd have different icons which do different things like look, you know, search or pick up. Um, I actually that didn't like that interface that much because I, I felt it actually watered down some of the responses that you would get uh, with the point and click and that's just my personal opinion. I felt when you actually would walk around and type text you'd actually get um, more descriptions of, of, of things and sometimes little quirky answers when you try to do things that, that you probably shouldn't be doing. Um, you know, uh, like you, I'm just giving a raw example. You'd put like spit at your boss or whatever, just then, you know, and it, it respond, you probably shouldn't do that or something like that. Like, just, I mean, that's just a, a loose example. But they, they programmed in all these sort of quirky responses for things that you shouldn't have done. But that's basically what, what you know, Sierra Online did. They, they specialized in adventure games. Uh, they did also. So they produce their own games, and they also publish a number of games uh, like Dexter, um, you know, it's, you know, stuff for the Dynamic series. Basically, um, you know, games that they felt that had value, and they they utilized their name and their channel uh, to be able to to uh, publish these games. Um, you know, Manhunter, uh, I think, is also another one that comes comes to mind. But um, so they also that that also gave. Uh, uh, using the Sierra name, even though they weren't specifically produced by them, they all, that also gave some different, uh, a different, a little bit different edge just from the adventure games that they produced. But overall, the quality of what they chose and what they produced was always very, very, very high. So um, yeah, you know that's that's basically what what Sierra games. That's what they what they were. So now just going into um, you know what was what was great about them now. The greatest thing about Sierra Games was just hands down the storylines. The storylines were just fantastic. And to this day and age, I still don't find myself getting engaged to the level that I did with Sierra Games. They just they just had a fantastic storyline storyline. And later on they started to you know, call them interactive movies, which essentially that's what they were. You know, they were uh, movies which you're interacting and you're involved in. Um, and they, um, you know, you could still get, uh, you know, uh, like walkthroughs or hint books to, you know, walk you through the whole game on how it works and, you know, you know what you have to do step by step. And it'd still be fun. It would still be fun because it just like, you just want to see what happens next in the, in the story. Things were not, not predictable and... Um, you know, it's still pretty a linear game, but you'd still just want to see what what happens next. And the storylines were just just fantastic. Um, Sierra, I think, did a fantastic job of, of branding. Uh, they really branded their, their characters, and maybe that's because there weren't that many options back back then in computer gaming. Um, you know, today, obviously, they you know they try to brand characters like Laura Croft and. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, the guy from God of War, can't remember his name. And, you know, back then maybe there wasn't as many options, so those characters stuck in your mind. But I found that you, you, you uh, created an attachment to the, those characters and, and really felt a sense of connection, whether it be King Graham, Roger Wilco, or, uh, or Leisure Suit Larry. You just You felt a connection to those, those characters. Um, and... and They'd also include this Sierra catalog with every uh, game that they'd ship, and it'd show all the different games that they had. And you know, their brand was so strong. I used to find it feel just getting excited to to read about those other games and wanting to play them, or reading about the games that they have in development. Like they just they just had such a strong brand that, and that's that's a goal of when you know you've achieved a good brand that people just trust the quality of, of what you're going to produce and. And, and, you know, almost like anything. I mean, even games like Mixed Up Mother Goose, I played, even though it was more of a children's game, and, and enjoyed it just because of Sierra. Like, I just, I just loved, 
Uh, I love Sierra so much. I mean, heck, back then I was just learning how to computer program. I wanted to work for Sierra. Like that's that was my that was one of my dreams to to work for them. And of course, you know, uh, the nature of the company changed, and I grew up. And obviously, when you know, growing up, you look at other things like what's financially rewarding and what will op- continue to open doors for you in your career. But you know, they they just had such a powerful brand that that uh, you know. You, you you were just you were just drawn uh, to it. They also had a, a really uh, ahead of its time concept of, of building a community. So they actually had uh, a BBS, which you know, which was essentially the Sierra World. And for those of you who don't know what a BBS is, uh, this was before the days of the internet, or before the days of the internet becoming mainstream. People had bulletin board services. Uh, which they would host, and you would dial up those bulletin board services through your modem, uh, through your telephone line, so not your high-speed internet. And you'd go onto forums, and you'd download different stuff, uh, and it'd be it'd be all p- pretty slow. Sometimes it would take a couple days to download stuff, but they were really ahead of their time in building that sort of um, community, and that would help to enhance their uh, enhance their their, their brand. Uh, even further, right? But you know, back then also, just there was just also a sense of you know not only the community, but but like computer gaming was like a, a bit of a cult hobby. Um, you know, back then, if, if most people played games, they'd either go to the arcade, so they'd physically leave their house and go play a game standing up the whole time, like standing up. That's crazy, and put quarters and they put quarters in all the time uh, who am I kidding people still still do that apparently but you know but hey you know back then that was the thing to do you know go to the arcade or you'd have a console like a uh, Nintendo or an Atari and you'd plug something in and stick a cartridge which is like the PS3 and Xbox and people knew how to do that but very few people knew how to play games on the computer let alone even use a computer they didn't even know what to do with it um, you know if you're using like something like Commodore 64, some people had some idea, but you get into IBM PCs, you just get a big, you know, DOS prompt. People didn't know what to do. And to to play the Sierra games for the most part, which were mainly on the PC, um, you'd have to have some basic level of competence with computers. Uh, you'd have to, you know, be able to understand the command line, uh, how to use that, maybe set up extended memory or expanded memory, and, and most people were not comfortable with that. So when you found other people that played the Sierra games, there was just a, a, an instant sense of connection with them uh, in that community of doing something that was special and being able to, to share that with them. And, um, yeah, so, you know, it, it, it just inherently built a sense of community in, in itself when you find other people who would play uh, Sierra games, and that's what just what made it so, so interesting. Um, so why would you play, you know, Sierra games now? So, you know, bottom line is the storylines are fantastic. And still to this day, I still have not found myself um, getting involved and in, engaged in the stories like like the way the Sierra series does it. It's just, they're just fantastic. They're not predictable. Uh, and, and... You know, and everything just has a personal touch to them. Now, nowadays, just a lot of games can be, uh, it's like corporations just spewing out duplicates of the same game and trying to capture an audience and make it so mechanical. Uh, you know, like trying to produce something that will attract, you know, the Call of Duty crowd and, uh, you know, you throw on some army theme and throw on some guns and people will start playing it. Whereas this was, you know, it was art. It was art and... Uh, the founders, Roberta and Ken Williams, even though they may not be heading up every project of the game, like you felt like every project was vetted by them and they had their personal touch added to it. Uh, so the storylines were just, just you know, uh, fan- fantastic. And, um, you know, it, it, they just challenge you in a different way. You know, they challenge you. I mean, you can go on the net and you can get walkthroughs. But, um, you know, you, you can, the, the challenge in my mind for most of the games were just right, where you challenge your mind a little bit with some of the puzzles, uh, but, you know, you still be able to walk around, you think about it, and, and um, you know, 
and then and then sort of solve the puzzle in your mind as to you know uh, putting different connections together. So I found the level of challenge you know to this day even is just 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 right, not too hard, but um, you know still enough to keep it keep it interesting. But also now scary games like anyone can run them. Anyone can run them. Anyone pretty much with the basic level of computers that can go on and surf the net can play the Sierra game. So there's no system requirements. I mean, the highest level back then in terms of graphics, well, um, I, I'm more related to some of the older uh, adventure games, but would be VGA. I didn't really play too many of the games in, in, uh, after the mid-90s, but would be pretty much VGA. And um, VGA is like, you know, we're not, we're not talking about Super VGA. We're, we're not talking about 800 by 600. We're talking like 300 resolution by something whatever but even though the graphics were not like the resolution was was low and and you know it, the the art was great like the art, actual artwork was was great um and they took time to to do things but anyone can run sierra games pretty much these days and um you know it doesn't require a lot of system system requirements um and they either can be found free or for very cheap. Um, so, you know, it doesn't have the heavy cost of, of buying some other games. And, and there's just tons of them. There's just tons of them. If you like, like I found when I, if you liked one of them, you usually like the other one, right? Like if I like, I like King's Quest, I also like Space Quest as well. I also like Leisure Suit Larry. Like they just, it just, they're just continuous in, uh, in the enthusiasm for them. So, you know, how do you play Sierra games today, then, if you're interested in playing them? So, uh, you know, there's a couple different ways. So one is uh, you can get a copy of the old Sierra games, uh, and you can use DOSBox. So DOSBox, what that does, it emulates the uh, the DOS machines for those kids out there. Before we had these little Windows things, we used to have a little command line called DOS, uh, which would be require a lot of typing. Uh, not pointing and clicking a mouse and running an install wizard, but I digress. So you have DOSBox, which is an emulator for DOS, and um, you can use that. And, and in some cases, you do have to do some configuration. Uh, you can, along with DOSBox, you can. There's actually download uh, uh, a tool that's called Defend Reloaded. And what that does is, if it recognizes certain games and uh, the type of uh, certain games or certain programs. It actually has some presets which it actually helps to configure DOSBox for you. So, uh, pretty much all the Sierra games that I've downloaded and used a Defend Network, I found it uh, it helps set them up and um, pretty much got them working no no problem. Um, but you know it does require some level of comfort in terms of technical aptitude to use Defend Network. Um, the other option is to to download something from from GOG. And now GOG, what they do is they take uh, the original games and they hook it up to DOSBox and they configure DOSBox and they make it more of a plug and play process where you just basically download it and you install it and it does all the configuration for you and you're good to go. Uh, most people will probably prefer that option. Uh, you do have to pay a little bit. They do charge. For the games that they they sell, it's still not a high cost. I mean, we're still, you know, uh, it's the price of, a, of of an app basically in some cases where you get like, you know, three games in one. So you get a lot of game for your your value there. Uh, so that's that's probably the most preferred method is you go to GOG.com and um, and just just download uh, and, and purchase uh, some of the versions out there. Uh, the other thing, there's also some uh, other way is there's also some fan base remakes. So uh, basically, King's Quest, so Sphere Online, I'm using King's Quest as an example, but they had a number of games where they first produced an EGA version. Uh, and basically, EGA was a level of graphics known as, jeez, uh, I almost I forget the acronym, uh, Enhanced Graphics Adapter. And that was 16 colors, and I can't even remember the resolution, but you know, it equals crap, crap graphics. I mean, and it got even crappier, actually. EGA was, was 
good back then. then they had CJ and then they had Hercules Monochrome. But anyways, EJ back in the 80s was the top of the line uh, back then. And some people didn't even have EJ. They had CJ, which was three or four colors. And then they came up with VGA, which was 256 colors, which sort of set the standard for what we have today, but we got closer to graphics that are more where they could produce stuff that looked you know, close to real video, real photographs. And then they did upgrade, so they had the original King's Quest game, and they upgraded to a VGA version, right? So I'm, I'm digressing a little bit. Uh, they didn't get around to upgrading all the games in a VGA version, but what they've done is uh, there's a number of fans out there that have, have taken some of the King's Quest games that weren't done in a VGA version and remade them into a VGA version, like like Space Quest, uh, Space Quest Two, and basically um, completely done as a labor of love. Fans have done it for free. You can download them for free, and uh, you know most of them are just plug and play and download uh, by today's standards. And uh, in some cases, you really can't even tell that it wasn't even made by Sierra. They just did a fantastic job uh, of remaking these games. Uh, in, a, in a VGA version. And mind you, VGA is still outdated a little bit. Well, not a little bit. It is outdated still by today's standards, but, you know, it's still colorful. It's still, again, still emulates a good good artwork style. But So you can get a lot of those fan-based made games. In some cases, they have a couple different versions made by different people uh, of the fan-based game, uh, based game uh, that's that's made. Uh, such as, uh, I believe it's King's Quest Three. they have a couple different versions of that made by different studios, uh, which you can, you know, I guess, try your preference, which one you like you like better, which version you like better. So that's that's a nice way to do it. Uh, a bit of a novelty way to play Sierra games, and an interesting way, is uh, you can actually play online uh, with other players using uh, just a browser. If you go to Sarian.net, you can actually play some of the old EGA version. You'll see what exactly what EGA looks like. Uh, pretty crappy back then, but... Uh, w well, it was actually, no, pretty good back then, uh, but pretty cr pretty darn crappy when you look at, look at it now. But uh, you can play games like King's Quest, Police Quest 1, Space Quest 1, Black Cauldron. You can play them online, and you play play through the game with other players playing it simultaneously and you can give each other other tips and it's a bit of a novelty project but it's pretty pretty cool you know it's just pretty interesting concept and all you need to do is you have an internet connection uh, you have a browser if you have uh, Java uh, installed on your system you should be able to play it which most people today in this day and age if they do anything they probably have that installed uh, but really interesting concept and, and you know uh, you know, again, a bit of a novelty, but I'm sure fans will really enjoy that. So, so now just walking through you through some of the games that I think are worth playing in the Sierra uh, lineup. They have, as I mentioned, tons of games, but I'm just going to talk to you about the main ones, the ones that are most uh, popular. Uh, first, there's the King's Quest series, and this is probably the most popular and most well-known series. And what makes King's Quest great is that... Um, it's applicable to all ages. You, you know, young or old can play it. Um, it's not necessarily catered towards any specific age demographic, which back then was a sensitive topic. Um, you know, nowadays, of course, you have kids playing really violent games out there, which you know people might not. You know, some mothers out there are not not happy. But back then, it was a really sensitive topic, and um, you know, relative to uh, you know. Uh, general society space invaders would be considered violent. So, you know, they wanted games that uh, a game like King's Quest back then could be played by all ages and was age friendly. Um, and and also uh, with that, also the level of storylines would be interesting enough for an adult and interesting enough for for a kid to play and and still understand exactly what is what is happening with that. But the best thing about the King's Quest was was the diversity in the game. Uh, and the theme it generally followed generally followed a medieval theme, but it focused a lot around uh, folklore, lore, and fairy tales. And basically, if you um, so they'd have different puzzles that would revolve around different fairy tales and folklore. And if you knew the the fairy tale, that would help you solve the puzzle. But it's just very diverse in some of the things that they presented um, in terms of the the themes. 
Um, you know, so, uh, yeah, it just, you know, you'd have everything from vampires like, like Count Dracula to mermaids. Um, it just, it just, you know, a pretty wide, wide gamut of, of, uh, things that you'd see in the game. Uh, the next would be the Space Quest series, and this was personally my favorite series, and, uh, Space Quest was a sci-fi theme, and basically, um, what made, you know, uh, Space Quest great for me was being sci-fi that, you know, they'd have a number of different settings and places that they could take place, the game could take place on different planets, and you'd meet different aliens, uh, but the game was just funny. Like, it was the funniest out of all the Sierra series that that uh, were out there. And they didn't try too hard to be funny. Like, it was subtle. They were subtle about it. And, you know, I just I just found, like, just a very, yeah, it was just very subtle humor. Uh, and it was effortless in the way, the way uh, they made it all steam and, and made it all wind together. And to this age, day and age, I still haven't found a game like Space Quest with that type of theme, that sci-fi, and, and that, that, you know, takes itself, uh, you know, with a sense of humor. And I'm not talking about, like, Mass Effect, I'm talking about, like, Space Quest. Like, you know, there, there isn't something like, like Space Quest, and not hating on Mass Effect for all you Mass Effect lovers out there, but, yeah, it just was very unique in the way they wound things together. Um, the next would be the Quest for Glory series, which was almost a mix between King's Quest and an RPG. And it, they did something different where they add an RPG element where you'd create a different character, uh, a class based on a thief, mage, or fighter, and you'd build up the character uh, and build up their attributes. And made it interesting that you'd select the different classes and you'd play the game slightly differently. And that was really an interesting concept that, that I found that they... Uh, wound together. Um, so Quest for Glory, you know, it, it, it was great in that, that different element um, of adding sort of an RPG element. They also tried to make uh, the action arcade-like and, and you, know, you know, in real-time combat, which, in my opinion, was a bit of a fail. I mean, and, and this is, mind you, going back to when computers were pretty slow back then, so I remember Quest for Glory 1, you'd he hit the, the left key to dodge, and it, it, he dodged like two seconds later. And so I was like, okay. And then you'd, you'd like hold down the button to start stabbing the guy, and the guy would stab him like 50 times, and, and then you'd, you'd want to block after that, but he'd still be stabbing him, right? So, and that's relative to the time. I, I still appreciate the fact that they made an attempt to make a difference of just uh, turn-based rolling, um, you know, roll, a rolling of a dice. But, but um, yeah, I mean, the action wasn't, fantastic, but, but it was still a pretty unique concept back then, which Sierra was good at creating unique concepts. Uh, the next would be the, the Police Quest series. Uh, this was actually my least favorite series, and not to say that I didn't enjoy it, it just wasn't, um, you know, I just didn't enjoy it as much, and uh, this, Police Quest is definitely an adult game, so you are, you know, a police officer in the Police Quest series, and the game was actually written by a former police officer, and you actually have to go on different missions uh, that a police officer would, would go on, such as doing a, a drug investigation or playing traffic duty and doing things by the book, and it helps to learn a little bit about pr uh, police procedures. And, as I mentioned, it's pretty serious, and I wouldn't say necessarily violent per se by today's standards, but, you know, there would have been some uh, violent insinuations like murder back then, which would have been a, a big deal, but, you know, it took itself seriously, um, and, uh, you know, I, I just, uh, I enjoyed it, but, um, you know, I, I kind of like games that, that, you know, some like Space Quest, which is a bit of an in-between where, you know, it can be a little bit quirky, but, but still... Uh, still have an interesting storyline as well. In my opinion, Pol Police Quest probably wouldn't rank as well for modern players today, so people entering this year online uh, series today and trying to get interested in it that have never heard of it might not be as interested in Police Quest just because it does focus on realism and, and seriousness. And the reason why I say that is because m a lot of games these days tend to lean towards realism and seriousness and and they do a good job of it with the the realism and the graphics and uh, you know bringing in multiplayer and bringing in you know a human element to it and uh, 
and having you know real soundtracks and real voice acting and all that sort of stuff. And uh, you know that's something like Police Quest. It tried to be serious, and I don't think it can compete with um, games of today without you know without that that obvious gap in technology becoming very apparent on how they can't communicate that. Whereas uh, most games back then, they knew that they, they didn't have the technology to to be realistic, so they wouldn't try. And so that's where they're in their own little realm. Like, when you're playing a game like like Space Quest or Super Mario, you don't care that it's 2D. Like, because they're not trying to make it realistic. They're just, you know, you know you're just you're letting your imagination flow. It's, it's like my blog, video blog post that I put on the difference between 2D games and 3D games. Like it's, they're playing in their own element and competing on their own element, uh, which is not trying to be serious. But just my personal opinion, I think Police Quest is still a great series. Um, you know, end of the day, if you like it, you like it. You know, good on you. Um, I still liked it, but uh, it still wouldn't, it wouldn't be my, it wouldn't be my go-to game right now that, that, I have as much of an impression on um, compared to other games. Uh, and then there's now Leisure Suit Larry. So Leisure Suit Larry um, is, ba- is basically uh, the object of the, the first game and uh, was basically to get action from women. And that's sort of the theme throughout the, the rest of the series. And in the first game, you're actually a sort of a, like a 40-year-old virgin guy and you know trying to lose your virginity. And then after the after you do lose your virginity, the rest of the games are all about more or less getting action from women. Um, if it weren't from the fact that it was uh, a bit of a um, you know a racy topic, you know I don't think Leisure Suit Larry would have been as popular as it as it was. Uh, you know again this is like the 80s and you know back then like nothing like that was ever done and people just would get it probably just more at a uh, curiosity, and actually, I think the game was one of the most pirated games because they Sierra Online actually sold more hint books than they did copies, which shows how many people had actually copied it. And it was sort of like a game that people would pass along their office mates. They actually had this interesting thing called a boss key, which was really funny. Like you'd actually be playing the game and you'd hit Alt uh, Alt B, and all of a sudden these spreadsheets would come up and these graphs would come up. And it was meant for that if you're playing the game at, at work, that if your boss is walking by, to make it look like you're doing <laughs> real real work, which is, uh, you know, uh, kind of quirky and kind of funny. But uh, anyways, um, the game was funny, uh, but I enjoyed Space Quest's humor more. Uh, they tried to be more funny by being a little bit more over the top and shock value. And that's what I mean. Like, if it weren't from the fact that it was sort of a racy topic, like, I don't think it would have been as popular as is. Um, you know, the game wasn't pornographic per se. I mean, like this cartoon figure, so how graphic can you get? Um, so it's still relatively friendly in that respect, but but just you know, it, it it was just a different a different topic that wasn't wasn't out there, right? And if it wasn't that that hook on sexuality, probably wouldn't be as uh, uh, as popular as it was, right? So those are some of the most popular games with with Sierra. Uh, they actually, like I mentioned, they have hundreds of games out there. Uh, some other games out there were like Black Cauldron, Mix of Mother Goose, uh, Gabriel Knights. You can actually go to www.sierragamers.com, and that's a site that was created by uh, Ken Williams, I believe, and he's probably too busy now and uh, traveling the world on his boat. But he's got a, a very comprehensive list of uh, all the games that they have. And also on that site, they actually have uh, different tips for the copy protection. So one of the ways that they used to do copy protection in the game was that you get halfway through the game and there'd be certain puzzles you can only solve based on uh, you potentially having the book that comes with the game, such as some secret code you have to enter in or something like that. So they have all that stuff there on the website, which uh, which which helps. So, yeah, so that's that's my take about Sierra games. Like, as I mentioned, if you're, if you're looking for something different, uh, you know, if you're bored of the current lineup of games, stuff games that, that don't get very deep uh, and engaging, uh, get you engaged in the storyline, you might want to check out Sierra games. Um, they're not, you know, any, they're not, they're, they're not high demand, don't have uh, any massive requirements on the system uh, or any system whatsoever. They're, they're cheap and, you know, you really got very little to lose to, to try a Sierra game or two. Uh, 
if you have an open mind and uh, you know are just looking for something different, I'm pretty sure you won't be disappointed. So check it out. Happy gaming.